the New Testament this morning, the second, uh, the book of Second Corinthians. Uh, that's Second Corinthians, chapter twelve. Second Corinthians, chapter twelve, and we'll commence at verse one. And as we come to this, I would remind you that this is the living word of our living God that comes to make us alive in Christ Jesus. It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I should not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he saith me to be, or that he heareth of me, unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong, and become a fool in glorying. You have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you, for in nothing am I beheld the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. And we will end our reading there at verse 11, and we know that God would add his blessing to his word. Just something that came into my mind there. <clears throat> verse 10, and we might come to this again uh, as we go through this, the, the, what we've read this morning. But look at what Paul says there. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. How many of us would take pleasure in infirmities, that's sickness, in reproaches, that's been put down, in necessities and persecutions, we all know about persecution, and distresses for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of us would take pleasure in that? Be honest. Now that's a subject for a whole other sermon. There's absolutely no doubt about that. It's a subject for a whole lot of other sermons. Never mind just one. But yet we're told by none other than the Lord Jesus Christ that for his name's sake, persecution will come. And yet there is Paul, a man who knew great hardship from the moment he, he, he got saved, converted on the road to Damascus right to the very end of his life, he knew various hardships. His was not an easy life. Yet he would say, I take pleasure. There's a challenge for us. And in these days when the church, we, t we talk about the persecuted church. Really, it's just part of the church because the church is the church. And persecution in this country towards the church is a whole lot more subtle than it may be in some other parts of the world. But it is getting worse. It is getting worse. It is getting worse. On the way up, we were listening to the news. Uh, a lady who was standing as a counsellor let her Christian viewpoint be known that marriage should be between one man and one woman. Now, that's not an unreasonable thing for anybody to say because, after all, that's exactly what God's word tells us marriage should be. You want to know about that? Go back to Genesis 3. Read it there. But her employer found out about it and sacked her. Because her attitude, well, that might offend somebody that thought 
something wrong. So let's hold on to that truth. Because remember, I've known that it's a sort of a but um, an add-on, really, not, and I don't mean it the way it sounds, but it's just something that's come into my head. We have to rejoice in all things. We are quick to say that we have a peace that passes all understanding. Isn't that right? We, have, we say that. We will confess that. For example, when we suffer a bereavement, we do not grieve as others that are without hope. We know that. And we will say, well, I have this joy that passes all understanding because Christ is in my life. Well, this is exactly the same thing. So when hardship comes, when persecution comes, we have to have that same mindset. We have to have that same thing in our heart because Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if Christ was in our own life can bear us up when we're facing the personal hardship of bereavement, for example, then surely he can bear us up because he's the same man, isn't he? Now that doesn't mean that that's easy. But when we trust, and as we're going to see, when we trust in God, we can do it. So, now, to the beginning. In the verses that we read together, these 11 uh, verses from uh, 2 Corinthians 12, there's an awful lot in there. And our focus this morning will be the words of the Lord Jesus himself as we find them there in verse 9. My grace is sufficient for thee. But for the sake of context, I'm going to speak a, a little bit about the verses that come before it sort of generally to, 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 to set the, the, the scene for us, if you like. The first six verses of this chapter is the Apostle Paul describing a vision that he had had. He's talking about himself there, although he's not saying that it's himself. He said that he wasn't expedient to glory. I knew a man, but he was speaking of himself. Now the precise date of when this vision happened, it's not known. Of course it's not known. But Adam Clark, that great Methodist commentator, suggests that the vision occurred about the time Paul was brought by Barnabas from Tarsus and Antioch. You can read about that in Acts chapter 11. And that was thought to have been about the year AD 57. So 57 years after the birth of Christ, and 20 odd after he was crucified and resurrected, these events happened. And Paul and Barnabas had been sent from the church there at Antioch with arms, in other words, with money, with help, charity, if you want to use it, because that's love, arms, charity, it's all the same sort of an idea to the, the believers in Jerusalem, because the believers in the church of Jerusalem were suffering persecution in that place, from the Romans, from the Jews. And it was then that Paul experienced that vision, when he was probably in Jerusalem. And it was one that would, have doubt, would help him establish him in the faith that, uh, that would grow and that he would work and cause him to, to do what he had done. Now it's evident here to us all, or at least I hope it is, that the wording throughout those first uh, few verses, first seven verses actually, shows that Paul is torn as to whether or not he should speak of these things. You see, he doesn't want to boast about himself. You go on to YouTube and you'll get all of these televangelists and some of them are like nut jobs and really should be avoided because they're very little and have nothing to say that's of any value. But you'll get one or two at the minute that's going on and saying that they were taken up and gone to heaven and they're boasting and they're rumbling and they're blowing about all the. But you look at the way Paul deals with this because Paul had been taken up into heaven. That's what it says there. He was taken to the third heaven. It is not, in verse 1 he says, it is not expedient for, expedient for me doubtless to glory. The new King James renders that it is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. Paul did not want to boast. He didn't want to boast. There's no profit in boasting. In verse 5, yet of myself I will not glory. 
the New King James. Yet of myself I will not boast. Uh, verse 6. For though I would desire the glory, I shall not be a fool. The New King James. For though I might desire to boast, I will not. Do you see here? Boasting. Boasting of himself. Because what would happen then, and we all know this, that if something as glorious as that happened, it would be, well, hold on a minute. I'm the big lad. Look what happened to me. I was taken to heaven. None of you were. I was. God showed me around. Now look, I'm not, but that's the way we would be. Be honest. So Paul here is saying, there is absolutely no profit in me boasting what happened to myself. Why? Because as far as Paul was concerned, the only one that was to get glory was the Lord Jesus Christ. Not Paul, not Saul of Tarsus. The Lord Jesus Christ. We'll come back to this when we see the way Paul talks about himself. But it wasn't, you see, and he, he crowns it all off and makes it quite clear to us there in verse 7. We have that reason for Paul's reluctance. Lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, you would think in our human terms, if there was a man that should be exalted, could be exalted, it would be a Paul. Isn't that right? Like, look at how much of the Old Testament, or the, not the Old, the New Testament that he, had, that he wrote. He was the 13th apostle. Apostle was someone that had actually been, seen, been with Jesus. Paul was the 13th. So you can see here that Paul was incredibly wary of saying anything that would give the appearance that he was seeking the limelight. Paul seeks to glorify only the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is of much regret, brothers and sisters, that in today's world, the exaltation of self is seen as the way to do things. It is of even greater regret, or it should be of even greater regret, to those of us who name Christ's name, who are part of the church, that we should regret that this humanist and therefore satanic way of thinking has penetrated the church to such an extent. The writer of the Proverbs at chapter 3 and 4 advises, In all thy ways acknowledge him. Yet, and I don't think I'm overstating it in any one way, if we were going to give a true modern rendition of this verse, it would be twisted to read, In all your ways acknowledge yourself. You see, it's an indisputable fact that modern life requires that in everything we do, we are required to sell ourselves, at least if you want to get on. Yet the Bible tells us we must do the very opposite. You see, job I used to do required me to do, you know, give people advice on how to get, you know, apply for jobs and what to do and how to present themselves at interview. And it's a sad fact that when you go to do a job interview now, your favourite words have to be I, me. All of the things that make you seem great. I invented the nuclear bomb. Now, listen, it wouldn't matter if I worked in the same office and all I did was share paper when they were making the nuclear bomb. I made, I helped me, I made, now you don't say I helped make the nuclear bomb. I made the nuclear bomb. What did you do? I made sure that the paper was shredded so as nobody would steal the secrets. It's as silly as that. But that is the way we're told we have to behave. We are to build our self-esteem. Now there's a whole thing around that. But that's what modern psychologists tell us. We have to build ourselves up. Before we can understand this, that and the other, we have to glory in our own selves. Our own self-importance. But here's the thing. 
God's word tells us, God's word tells his people that we must do the very opposite. John the Baptist, uh, John 3, 24, he, who's he? The Lord Jesus Christ must increase, right? Christ must be exalted. And here's the, here, here's the sledgehammer for people today. But I must decrease. Now people can't get their heads around that. They can't. Now, there was, now you think about that. John the Baptist was saying that. People were coming from all over to be baptised in the Jordan by this man. He had a great ministry. But yet he acknowledges that what Christ brought, what Christ had, what Christ was, what Christ is, was much, much greater than him. And therefore he gives us this truth that Jesus must increase and I must decrease. So just before we move on, let's take just a couple more minutes and consider precisely how Paul felt about self-proclamation. Philippians 3. We're going to read nine verses from it. Begin at verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evildoers. Beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he has comfort, uh, that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Okay, so what Paul's saying there is, you know, don't start arguing among yourselves about who's the best and who's the greatest, because if any of among us has a right to boast, it's me, and then Paul sets out his, his credentials. And these are some credentials. Circumcised the eighth day, so he was a Jew. Okay? So that elevated him straight away. He was one of God's chosen people. He was a Jew. Of the stock of Israel. Okay? He was, an, he was a Jew. He was an Israelite. Of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, tri Benjamin was the smallest of the tribes. Why was that important? Because the first king of Israel was chosen from that tribe. And therefore was held in esteem. So Paul was a Jew. He was an Israelite. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. A Hebrew of the Hebrews. You know, he was the man. As concerning the law, it says, as touching the law, a Pharisee. Now, as far as the law was concerned, the Pharisees could not be faulted as far as the outward and the legalistic notion of the law was concerned. They were the men. In fact, the Pharisee, the Pharisee sect was set up to protect God's word. Now, their motive might have been good at the start, it was unnecessary, but it might have been a good motive, a sound motive, if you like. That's arguable. But it had become corrupted because it had become a faith and a religion of works. Now, that didn't happen just in the Jewish tradition or the Jew, among the Jews at that point. It was happening right throughout the Old Testament. But nevertheless, you're touching the law of Pharisee concerning the zeal. In other words, his enthusiasm as a Jew, as a Pharisee, was beyond reproach. Why? Because he was persecuting the church. What was he going to do when he was converted in the road to Damascus? He was going with letters of authority to persecute the church, to haul them out, kill them if they had to. It's touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. In other words, you could look at Paul, everything outwardly was wonderful. Christ looked at these men and said, you're like white and sepulchres. You're beautiful on the outside. On the inside, you're dead. You're full of dead man's bones and you stink. But then he asked this question. You see, he lays out his credentials. A lot of boys would have stopped there. I went, oh. Yeah. You just see it. You know, you go, oh, here, look, there's my credentials. But what things were gained to me, listen, those I counted lost for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered of all things. He doesn't count them. They mean nothing. Nothing. In the light of what Christ has done to him. And listen to how he. Describes all of this stuff. 
all of this earthly, this worldly, these worldly credentials that so many people hold up and exult. He says there, For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung. Now that's graphic. That's graphic. But that's what he says. He counts them as excrement that I may win Christ. That he that I may decrease that he will increase and I will decrease. That's what Paul's saying there. That I may win Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness, because your own righteousness is a self righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. There's what Paul thinks of all of this boasting and taking pride in your own self. And within the church, and the church in general, we need to learn this lesson, folks. We should not be exalting ourselves. We cannot stand higher than each other in God. If we are brothers and sisters in Christ, we are equals. We need to understand that. The only thing that we should be working for is the exaltation and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. The old catechism. Were any of you brought up in the old catechism? Yeah. I wasn't, but alert. Well, I kind of way was. One of the Sunday schools I went to in Uganda. What's the first question in the catechism? Now, everybody should know this whether you've done it or not. What is man's chief aim? And what's the answer? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. Now, that's the truth. That's man's chief aim. Not to glorify ourselves. Paul got on to that. And on that, we need to listen. Well, and everything that's in the God's word, we need to listen to. But what we're looking at this morning, we need to hold on to that, folks. Because you see, once we start getting big-headed about anything, we take over. We take over. And there's no, no, no worth in that. No worth. In verse 7, the Apostle Paul speaks about his thorn in the flesh. Which according to his own words, and Paul said this his own self, this was a means to prevent him boasting in none other than Christ. Now let's consider that. Paul's thorn in the flesh, what that was, is not known. There's been much conjecture, speculated that it was a physical impediment. Suggest, some people suggest that Paul was stooped over. He had a curvature of the spine. He couldn't stand straight. Others that he had a speech defect, a stutter. For which a preacher, and if he was a preacher, and he did do a little bit of preaching but not much, that would have been a serious impediment. Now, that's a fact. Others said that he struggled. Not necessarily that he had this you know, the speech impediment, but that he struggled with his ability to stand up and speak in public. Now, if you've, over the last couple of weeks, you may be aware, if you've been on this planet, you'll be aware that there's a conservative leadership battle going on. And one of the things that they've been casting against one of those candidates is that she's not very good at public speaking. She's a bit wooden. All right. But you go back to the culture, when Paul was there, the Roman culture, the inability to speak publicly for a preacher would have been a real big impediment because in that culture you were expected, somebody that stood up and, and spoke in, in public was expected to be eloquent, had a grasp of the language, could do it, wasn't nervous about doing it. Well, okay, you get nervous, but you, you can over, I'd not say you can overcome that. Um, you always get nervous but so you can see what's happening here there was this thing that Paul had this thorn in the flesh but Paul saw it not as an impediment and here we are we're about, you know, there's this recurring theme that Paul saw this 
as a good thing because it kept his feet on the ground. How so? So let's just consider, for the sake of argument, that Paul couldn't speak in public. He was shy or he, was, he didn't have the ability to put words together audibly, verbally. There would really have been... When Paul then stood up to speak, as he did occasionally, and when the Holy Spirit moved and souls were saved, there was absolutely no chance of anybody accusing Paul that it was his ability as a public speaker that caused men and women to come to Christ. Do you see what I'm saying there? If he stuttered and couldn't get his words strung together properly the way some of these men would have, oh well that was just him. He's a great preacher. He can stir up the crowd. Now if you, if you watch any of these old films of, and I'm, I'm thinking particularly of stuff from the Second World War, you, you watch Adolf. Now Adolf Hitler was an evil, evil Brit. But boy he could manipulate a crowd. See, why? Because he was an orator. He could whip up them into a frenzy. He could get them going. Now look, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with emotion in church. We should be emotional when it comes down to it. But not to that extent. And if, if it's a preacher that's whipping it up, then it's, probably, it's not going to be real. I don't think, anyway. I stand to be corrected in that one. But this is what Paul's saying here. Whatever it was, kept his feet on the ground that nobody could actually say it's him. When they looked at Paul, when there was the results from what Paul had done, when there, the, 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 there was a harvest, they had to look and say, well, that was the Holy Spirit. Do you see where we're, what, what Paul's saying here? So Paul had this affliction. And he had clearly asked the Lord to remove it on three separate occasions. It's recorded for us there in verse 8. And it was a, a cause of much trouble. And I say, and I say that, that it was a cause of trouble to him because of the words that he records in verse 9. And he says this, my grace, this is what Christ said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect and weakness. Now do we get that folks? Paul had asked that this thorn would be removed from his flesh but the answer was obviously no but the answer came no I will not remove it but my grace is sufficient for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Do you see that? That I will decrease and he will increase. Now these words, they're words of personal encouragement to Paul. That's what they are. Okay, you've got this thorn in the flesh, but my grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. They're a personal encouragement to the apostle, but we cannot, we dare not restrict these words just to Paul. This is the Lord God giving his people assurance that he is there for us and that he will give of his grace as the situation dictates. Now I have absolutely no doubt that what I'm about to say will not be new. But it's like most things with which we have become familiar. We often need to be reminded of the truth behind the familiar words in order for us to refocus Sometimes, hearing someone stating the blatantly obvious can switch a light back on that has long since gone out, or in some cases, turn the light on for the very first time. So let us spend some time now considering the statement that, uh, of Christ's, because that's whose words those are, that his grace is sufficient for us. The first thing we need to realise is that God does indeed give us grace according to our situation. According to our situation. The Lord's Prayer points us in that direction. Matthew 6, 11. What's the first thing we have? Give us this day our daily bread. Daily bread. 
This is the Lord instructing us that when we come before him, we should request what is sufficient for today. For today. Not for today, tomorrow and the rest of the week. Just enough for today. Later on in the same chapter, indeed the same sermon at Matthew 6.34, Jesus says this, Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Another translation renders those words in this way. Now, here we are. So don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Right? Get that. Don't worry about tomorrow. This is what Jesus is <coughs> telling us. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Don't pile stuff on yourself. My grace is sufficient today. Now when we seek to understand that God's grace is sufficient, we need to first understand that it is sufficient for our present situation. And that's a big thing. That penny needs to drop with all of us, me included. How often, and we are all guilty of this, and I'll say that without any fear of contradiction, how often do we look at a neighbour's situation, brother and sister in Christ, for example, and find ourselves saying, I don't know how I could ever deal with that if it happened to me. Have you ever said that? Yes, haven't we? Oh dear, love that creator. And I suppose in some ways it's understandable. Now I don't need to be specific about what that, that is. But we all know what I'm talking about. Yet God tells us that he will give us precisely what we need when we need it. No more, no less. We are naturally greedy. Isn't that right? We are naturally, naturally greedy. That's perhaps, well, greedy is maybe the wrong word. Maybe cautious is a better word. Better way of describing it. We like to save, to store things up for a rainy day. All right, just in case. Just in case. I remember talking to somebody from a church. It doesn't matter which one. He said, you know, we've nearly a hundred thousand pounds in the bank. I said, that's good. Why is that? Well, you know, we have it for a rainy day. Folks, it's raining. It's raining. You don't believe it. Look around you. It's raining. But yet, we like to keep a little bit back. And we're like that in our own lives. We like to be assured. We like to store things up. We need to make sure that it's all there just in case. Just in case. My dad never threw anything out. Very, very little. It was only whenever he could move little or nothing in the garage. And the garage he had built was for lorries, so it was a huge thing. And it would get cluttered up that much. Every now and again he had to sling stuff out. But he always kept it. You know why? Just in case he needed it. Now, people would say, well, he came up through the war. He was from that ge generation when there wasn't much in that. And I get all of that. And there's maybe a fair point to be made in that. But there are stuff. We could get into our wrist space. If you could get into our wrist space and sling a good three quarters out what's up there. Aside from the toys for the ground means, that's ground. They can stay. But the rest of the stuff, <coughs> haven't seen it in years. And all it's there for is to keep my back reminded that I can still lift heavy stuff. <laughs> and I'm as bad as my missus and that, my, my wife. Keep everything just in case. We hoard, we store. But that's not how God works, folks. It's not. Here's more biblical evidence. And we need to go back to God's word for our evidence. Okay? We need to go back to God's word. Exodus 16, verse 13. And it came to pass that at even the quails came up. This is feeding God's people in the wilderness. And covered the camp. And in the morning the Jew lay round about the host. And when the Jew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay excuse me, small round things, as small as the, the hoarfrost on the ground. <coughs> 
And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they wist not what it was. And, and Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given, us, given you to eat. This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather of it every man according to his eating, a number of every, uh, for every man according to the number of your, your persons. Take ye every man for them which are in his tents. And here's the bit I want to em emphasize. And the children of Israel did so and gathered some more and some less. In other words, some of them gathered more than they were told. It's very simple. Some of them gathered less than they were told. And when they did meet it with an homer, he that gathered much had nothing over. And he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. Now, what was happening there was that the provision was made. They were told how much they should take. Some people took too much because they were keeping to themselves. Others, for some reason or other, didn't take enough. But at the end of the day, it was all balanced out. So I hope that we see that the, the, the point that the Lord will give us was grace. Grace in the measure you require is, is just as he promised Paul. That's what it is and that's what he's promised us. This is the word of God. Jesus Christ, we said it earlier on, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. And as he promised the Apostle Paul back there in AD 57, what, <coughs> what he promised them then, that promise stands true for us. If we believe that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever, then we must believe that his grace is sufficient for us today, regardless of what we are facing. I am more convinced than ever that the church and we as individuals need to get hold of this great truth. We get it so easy today in this country. We have become comfortable in our lives where for the most part, and I know there are exceptions, but for the most part, we, we don't have to deal with any real hardship. Real hardship is rare in our country. And I know, I say, there are exceptions. I get that. We need to get back to the fact that what we have, what we need, is given to us by the Lord God. We also need to learn something else about God's grace, about the way that we live. Because when we want and we gather up and we hoard and we do whatever else we're doing, God's word talks about one of the gifts is being patience. And in the, 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 the biblical context, patience is something that is long gone. We don't have patience. We can't wait anymore. And that's to do an awful lot with the culture in which we live. I was pre and this came into my mind not that terrible long ago when I was preaching in another place. And I can remember. Who remembers the exchange in Mark? You remember the exchange in Mark? Right. You want to know how to the exchange in Mark? You had look at it and you had to write off or you had to do this, that and all. And it always said this at the very bottom of it. Please allow 28 days for delivery. Now right, could you imagine somebody waiting 28 days for anything to be delivered now? You can go on to Amazon, join Amazon Prime and you'll have your goods the next day. We won't wait. We don't have patience. We don't have patience. Fast food. You go into a chip shop and if you're waiting any more than five minutes, you're ready for fighting. Isn't that right? Yeah, because you want your grub. And if you're going into a chip shop, you're probably better off doing without the grub. But God's word says his grace is sufficient. And we need to have patience for the things of God. And that's a whole other sermon too. But we need to wait upon God. We need to have patience with God. We need to understand you see, Paul prayed three times about this, this thorn in the flesh. Now, it doesn't tell us what time span that, that three, whether it was three consecutive nights or three, month, three consecutive months or over three years or 300. We, we, we are not told that. But I would suggest that it just wasn't three separate nights. I, I, I find that hard to, to believe that it would have been. But nevertheless, but he said, the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. 
sufficient unto the day thereof. I will help you through. And we need to grasp that. Here's another thing about God's grace. God's grace does more than merely get us through, folks. It doesn't just get us through by the skin of our teeth. It causes us to triumph in our situation. It causes us to be victors, just as it did for Paul. The realisation that all we have is because of that grace should bring us to our knees. In fact, I would even say prostrate on our face before a holy God. It is a realisation that should help us leave all the old self-centred stuff behind. That all I have is only because of him. As I've already said, we all so often look ahead wondering how we would ever cope with a specific situation if it arose in our lives. Or perhaps how we would come to terms with the possibility of bad news. No, I'm not demeaning that. There's far too much bad news about it at the minute. But we only deal with those things. We can, as God's people, we can only deal with those things. And if you're outside of Christ this morning, you will not deal with them on your own. You can only truly deal with these in Christ Jesus. Why? Because it is his grace that is sufficient When we rely on Christ, we can deal with this. Why? Again, because his grace is sufficient. If we do not do it, if we do not rely upon God, whether we're a child of God or not, we rely upon ourselves. We rely upon ourselves. We become self-reliant. I wouldn't trust me the length that could throw me. And that wouldn't be a wild distance. So none of us can. There's only one that we can trust to that extent. And that is the Lord God himself. So brothers and sisters. May each of us come to terms with the fact that God's grace is sufficient for us today. Tomorrow is promised to no one. Do you ever think about that as well? Tomorrow is promised to no one. That might even be a surprise. Because if you listen to some people today, we're all going to live to were 120. Somebody came out, I can't mind where I heard that one. A child been born today can expect to live to 120 years. Just a lot. Tomorrow is promised to no man. But not one of us is promised and certainly never sure of tomorrow. Proverbs 27 verse 1, Boast not thyself of tomorrow. For thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. We all know that to be a fact. How many times have you turned on the television set, put on the news and heard of somebody or other who left home and in a tragic accident on the road, for example, never get to the end of their journey? Did they expect that to happen? No. They didn't. None of us can boast of tomorrow. For we are not assured even the next breath in our bodies. Now that might be morbid. And some people might say, Roy boy, you shouldn't be talking like that. Give everybody an uplift. We need to be realistic. Because we know that to be a fact. We need to wake it up to it. There is only one in whom we can trust. Truly trust. There is only one in whom we can and should boast. And that man is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul got that. John the Baptist got it. 